to be in the house of the Lord. I'm telling you what, aren't you glad that it's almost springtime? That beautiful sunshine after that little storm last Friday that came through and then the sun breaks out. You know, it always uh, seems to happen that way. Some of the worst storms and then a few hours later, the sun's breaking out and the birds are chirping. Everybody wants to know, where do the birds go during all these storms? But anyway, when it's over, they're back. So uh, we're just glad that the sun's shining today. And... Uh, now everyone can start complaining about the pollen. <laughs> and, uh, we, got, we got a few months of that, and then uh, we'll move straight from that into complaining about the heat <laughs> and the lack of rain. Then we'll move straight from that into leaves and then winter again. But we're not going to complain, are we? Amen, amen. So today is a review day, and Megan has the new books, so she'll be at her station in just a moment to hand out the books for uh, our next uh, group of lessons. We'll be in Unit 7, and, uh, you know, we still have some folks out sick. I'm not sure what happened to my front row up here. I know this side's had some sickness. See, they thought, oh, it's going to be great to go on a cruise. It's, a cruise is a Petri dish. You're, you're right up close to a whole bunch of people out in the middle of the ocean. And uh, they came back real sick after the cruise, real sick. And J.C. has not recuperated 100% yet. So keep them in your prayers. I'm not sure about Brother Hayes and Sister Hayes and them, but keep them in your prayers during this, Doc, Megan, that's mine. Oh, look, it's a toll-free call. Should I answer it? <laughs> no. No. Keep all of them in prayer. We're going to have a great day in the Lord today. We had a wonderful time here yesterday, and uh, I just know the, the Lord's here to meet with us. He's here to have fellowship with us. And uh, we're going to be able to come together and to worship Him in the truth and the Spirit. Amen? The Bible says that God is a Spirit. If we're going to worship Him, we're going to have to worship Him in Spirit and truth. And a lot of people don't uh, recognize the importance of the word truth. We have to stay in the truth. The truth is God's Word. And the Bible says, let every man be a liar, but God is the truth. So we know that we have to stay close in the Word of God and stay close to Him in our worship, in our praise, and all of our life, giving Him the glory for everything that He's doing for us. Please remember those that are still out sick. Uh, Linda Coots, there she's back. She was the only healthy one in the whole cruise. <laughs> I have a theory about that. I know most of the women will agree with me. You see, is that nine times out of ten, I always say that because I used to say always, but it's never always. But nine times out of ten, it's the mother that takes care of the sick kids. Well, see, what God does for you in that is he builds up your immunities. And then the, then the fathers who don't ever do it, the first little thing comes along. We're laying in bed like one of the kids asking our wives to come get us something to drink and it's a bowl of soup and I need some crackers and uh, bring me the Bengay and... Uh, you know, see, it? yeah, so the man flew. So uh, so she's healthy, and the rest of them are still not so healthy. So, But uh, we're glad you're here today, and uh, we want to remember those that are, that are sick. God's concerned about that, and, uh, and we, we have every right to expect that God will heal us, every right scripturally to believe that God will heal us. And so we want to pray for them and keep them in prayer. Keep our services today in prayer. Yes. Yes, sister. Yes. Amen. Who did you say it was? Her son, Jeffrey. Whitey. Yeah, I know, I know. I know.
Okay, we're talking about Jeffrey, quotations Whitey, and he had rotor cuff surgery. So let's keep him in our prayers today also, amen? What? Will still working on power lines today? Keep them in your prayer as well, amen. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessings on this services today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are, the Lord God creator of all the universe. And everything that we enjoy, everything we see, everything that is around us is from you. We know that you give good gifts unto your children. We praise you for this ability to be here today, God, that we're all physically able enough to be here. And we pray for those that are not able to be here today because of sickness or illness. Lord, we know that they may be watching this on Facebook. Let them know that we're praying for them, that we have them in our hearts and minds today. We ask you to intercede and touch for Sister Coots, O oh Lord. Touch Brother J.C., Lord. Touch uh, Jeffrey, Lord that you would bless him today in this rotor cuff situation. God, we know that you heal us. It's a simple, easy thing for you, for you created us in the beginning. Yes. And you can heal us at the very finest level, the nuclear level of our lives, oh God. You're there, yes. and your healing is there. And Lord, we know that you can restore us, oh Lord, back into good health. And we praise you for that. We pray for our pastor today, Lord, for the anointing of the Holy Ghost on him, the message that you prepared for us today, God. We want to hear it. We want to apply it to our lives, and we're eager and hungry for a move of the Holy Ghost in the midst of the people, Lord. We're hungry for this revival of our own spirits, Lord, each every individual, and collectively as the body of Christ, that you would be uplifted and glorified, that you would be praised for everything that you've done for us. You alone deserve the glory for everything. And we give you the praise for it. We give you so much thanksgiving, God, for our Savior Jesus Christ that redeemed us from our sins, covered us in the blood of the Lamb of God, gave us, I hope, in a future, and Lord, in a right relationship with God the Father. We are so thankful. And we praise you today for the blessings on this campus in every campus and every church that's growing God, that is proclaiming the word of God. Lord, we pray blessings on them today. May many come to know you through salvation, through the outreach of your churches around this world. And we'll give you the praise and the glory for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen, amen and amen. So we're doing a review today, and Megan's handed out the books for Unit 7. Okay, we'll order some more. Uh, I think they had a few, but I don't like to take them all because our senior adult class uses it, you know, them as well. So we'll get some more of those for everybody that didn't get any. And so we're going back and kind of looking over where we have gotten to thus far in our chronological study of the scriptures. And we began, of course, with Genesis 1 and 1. And, you know, it's very interesting that we have been uh, looking at how God was bringing uh, his children, the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the ones that he had given the promise to, those patriarchal fathers of the Jewish faith, that he had given the promises to that he would uh, give them this land that we know today is to be Palestine or Israel today. And that promise was central to them. They were from the Babylon area around what is today Iraq and had traveled all the way down into current day Israel and following the unction of God. That's what Abraham was doing. And while he didn't get to see the complete answer to what God was telling him, he didn't live long enough to see uh, his descendants to be as populous as the stars in the heavens. But he believed God. When he told him, he believed it, even though he couldn't see it. And, of course, if Hebrews chapter 11 tells us that our faith is not by what we see. It's the things that we can't see, and yet we have faith in it. And so Jesus always gave compliments to that kind of faith. When Doubting Thomas said, well, I'm not going to believe by nad. I'm not going to believe until I see the nail prints in his hands, until I can stick my hand in the sword where the sword went through his side. I'm not going to believe. But Jesus said, blessed are those who believe and have not seen. They have a greater blessing because it takes more faith. 
So he made these promises, and then, of course, we know that the whole turn of events that was taking place with the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 sons and how they sold Joseph off, and they were trying to kill him because of his visions that God had given him, that of his future status, right? And even Joseph kind of let that go to his head, didn't he? He started saying, well, I see all your sheaves bowing down to mine. I, I see these, all these 12 stars bowing down to my star. Even mom and dad's going to do it, you know. And so they got tired of hearing that. And the next thing you know, he's in Egypt. And now that leads us to how the rest of them ended up in Egypt, right? So the great famine that was taking place, and God had so anointed him to be able to prepare Egypt for this huge famine that was across the whole Mediterranean Sea area. And all the countries were being affected, and they were in dire straits. But God had, through Joseph, had made a way for Pharaoh to have tons and tons and tons and to where they, they got so much of the grain, they just, Joseph said, we can't even count it anymore. We're not even going to keep up the record anymore. We're, we've got that kind of food availability. And so because of all that, he was placed into a very prominent position in power. Remember we saw the, the videos where it was talking about where their tombs probably were, and, and yet their bones were not there because the promise that was made to them is they would take their bones back to Israel when the Israelites were delivered from the Egyptians. Well, at that time, they didn't want deliverance. They had a great place to live right there in Egypt. It was very fertile ground. They had crops. They had protection from the Egyptian army that would protect them from other countries coming in and enslaving them. They were living pretty good life there all the way through the lives of those 12 uh, of, of Abraham's sons through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So they had it really well there until they all passed away and then became a Pharaoh that didn't know anything about the God of the Jews. And this Pharaoh, of course, thought that they were too populous. Now, that's a fulfillment of God's plan, wasn't it? He said that they would be as populous as the stars in the sky. And so uh, these Jewish ladies were pretty fertile. And so they were having babies on a pretty regular routine. And, uh, and lots of them. And they grew so numerous that uh, the Egyptians who had the armies became worried. Worried that these might turn against us one thing and not, even though they're not so populous, they didn't have the weapons of warfare that if they turned against them, they could really mount a revolt, if you will, against Egypt. But they were afraid they would join some other country that did have a large army and overtake the Egyptian dynasty. That was their concern. So what do they do? They enslave them. They make them as slaves, and they became harsh taskmasters to the children of Israel. Now, as I was pointing out to my brother today, the reason I like this map here that I've got, this kind of a calendar, is it's so difficult for us to understand the immense uh, e periods of time that we're talking about. You know, I think I made the statement once before that it's hard for us because you're reading everything after the fact, right? And we, we kind of forget this time period and we wonder how could they be so silly, you know, to do these things. But they were in bondage, you know, for 400 years. That's a long time. This country hasn't been in existence that long yet. And so when you look at these expansive mass amounts of time, this is 2,000 years uh, since the creation. And I was telling my brother, when you look at this sometimes, there's something to be done about this circle thing, the circle maker. God's, the Bible says that God sits in the circle of the earth. When you look out into the heavens, all we see is planets that are round and circular. All we see is universes that are circular. All we see is spinning galaxies that are circular. And then if he, they've created this timeline because at 2,000 years you have the promise of Abraham. And then you come down and you have Christ. And then you come to our present day, which is about 6,000 years total in the mount of this circle. So I think, you know, me and you and everybody in this room, unless the Lord tarries, if he, if he doesn't tarry, we're going to get raptured out of here, right? If he does tarry, you're going by the way of the grave. So be ready. Okay? There is no salvation after the grave. When you draw your last breath, the deal's sealed. Okay? 
you got to know that you're in Christ. But it's going to be real interesting for those that are still here, if the Lord tarries, what happens when this thing comes full circle, right? We, we talk about full circle as being completion, right? When we say something has come full circle, it came from the beginning, and now you're back at the beginning again. It's going to be interesting when that, that 8,000 years comes around, right? Since the creation of the earth. Maybe interesting times. We're all going to, if the Lord takes us one way or the other, we're going to be in the stadium seats for that. Good seats. You're going to be able to see everything that's going on, you know. Uh, it's, going to be, it's going to be great. So God is going to deliver them, but it's been a long time since they heard about the promises of God. It's been, they've suffered a lot. Their kids have suffered. They've suffered. Many of them died without ever seeing the promise. They were beat to death. They were starved to death. It was just terrible, terrible, terrible times. And they had long since forgot about the promises to Abraham. So God was going to have to send them somebody that could remind them. God sends us people sometimes in our lives to remind us about things that we need to be reminded of. We need to, you know, because it's easy for us to complain, right? I mean, it is. I mean, we, we criticize the Israelites all the time because they complain. They complain. Every time they turned around, they had saw God do amazing things, and yet they complained. They saw things that were clear-cut, no doubt about it, miracles at the hand of God. They saw his presence with them. They recognized it and said, you know, we don't want to go up into the mount with Moses. You know, we're not going there because we'll surely die. And yet they still complained. And these were mourning and complaining about the harsh conditions. And in God's timetable, he's going to move. Uh, I was pointing out to my brother, we don't understand time. We, we, we struggle with it. Scripturally, when you're studying the Bible, you can't make assumptions about time periods because one scripture coming after another may be 100 years. And yet your reading is that after it was just bam, bam, but it may not have been. And when he uses words like a day and the evening and the morning was the first day, you can't interpret that to be a thousand years just so it fits some of your philosophy. Like these people that are non-creationists believe, right? They're evolutionists and they, oh, that was a million years. And, and so they try to force modern science into the scripture by saying what a day was. But now I, I thought about this, you know, sometimes things pop into my mind and I have to be careful. But I thought of this as a bicycle wheel. Now, any of us in here that actually rode bicycles as a child, probably not as many as we would think, but maybe when you rode a bicycle as a child, my day, we would get bubble gum with a little baseball card in it. And idiots us, we had no idea that those things might actually be expensive someday. I probably took a Mickey Mantle card and stuck it on my bicycle spoke I bet I did. And you could hear that click, 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 click. Y'all remember that? Well, if you put it down close to the hub, these little timelines are going click, 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 click. But if I move it out close to the front of the tire, it's click, 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 click. So a day unto the Lord is a day, and to us it's a thousand years. Because he sits in the center of the universe and time passes at a different rate for him. He thinks it's quick. To us out here, it's really long periods of time. That's how God operates in time. So 400 years to him is one of these little micro clicks. Click. But to those Israelites, it was 400 years. Right? Many generations came and went. But God's faithful to his promise to do it when he decides to do it. And he decided it's time to bring them out. I hear their cries. I hear their petition. I'm remembering my covenant that I made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I'm going to bring them out. And he calls this man Moses. Do you all remember Moses' parents' names? Anybody? Anybody can just throw it out. Oh, yeah. Don't you just... You, you know, it's right, it's right at the tip of your tongue. And, and yet, that wasn't a statement. That was a question, wasn't it? Because, because you see... They're insignificant in the plan of God. They were very significant. But to us, they don't get no special prizes. But how many has heard of Moses? Oh, yeah. Well, without his parents, there'd have been no Moses. 
right? But God calls Moses, and it was during a difficult time. They were killing all the children to try to keep the number of the Jews down. We've got to do something in population control here. Isn't it amazing how we have all kinds of good ideas on how to kill children? Boy, isn't that the brilliance of an enlightened society that we can come up with all different kinds of ways to kill the children? You know, we got a problem today. We're overcrowded. Let's kill all the children. You know, we got a problem today. Uh, we don't get to do what we want to do all the time, so let's kill the children. That's what they did. They said, let's just, they're getting too populous, so let's kill all the boy children. We'll kill all the boys. Throw them in the crocodile. Throw them in the Nile. So God made a plan for Moses to avoid that, and he did. And then, you know, God is so good, he took that real bad situation and said, you know, I think I'll just give Moses back to his mama. And so he had an Egyptian princess do that for him. Wasn't that amazing how God does that? So then Moses is going to come on the scene, and Moses is going to lead him out. So he had to first convince them that God was going to do this. Was it easy? Why is it so hard for us to believe the promises of God? Just ponder that for a minute. You know who God is. You admit that he is the creator of the universe. You admit that he can do anything, anytime that he wants to do it. And he, there's nothing that he cannot do. Nothing. Right? If he wanted to take all of us Christians off this planet and put us on a new one, could he do that? In a split second. What a ride that would be. You know, to get uh, zapped off of this earth and put on another one somewhere, Ricky. Man, you'd hit the ground over there as a different person, wouldn't you? But we don't, we have, and we're so hard to believe the promises of God, and they were too. They said, look, all I can see, this is what I can see. Squalor, poverty, hardship, whippings, don't have, you know, we don't have this. They treat us like dogs and everything. And here you waltz in here with this grandiose plan that you're just going to march us right on out of Egypt. It took a little convinces, convincing of Moses to convince them. And he had to start over by reminding them of the promises that God had made to their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Sometimes we have to remind you of whence you came from. Least you forget where you came from and what God has done for you. And not only what he's done for you, because you're saved today, thank God you're not in prison someplace. Thank God that bad things aren't happening to you somewhere, right? God's kept you out of all that, and he's put you where you are. And he says, and that's not all. I've got a lot of good things in store for you. And we have difficulty believing that sometimes. They had real problems believing Moses. And so God has to not only show Pharaoh that he has the ability to do it all. Remember I showed you all the names of Pharaoh? And every one of them matched up with one of the plagues that God sent against Egypt. Because he was showing them that you can fabricate gods out of anything, including iPhones if you want to. But he is still God. And he controls everything. And he was going to show Pharaoh, you can call yourself a god, but you're not a god. You can call yourself anything you want to, but you're not. The Bible says that God looks on the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at your heart. And he knows whether or not you believe him. If you're trusting in him. If you've accepted salvation for real or not. Or you just, as we like to call it today, colloquially, play, playing church. We're just going to play church. Why in the world do you want to do that? Why in the world would you want to come down here and put on a show to try to convince other people at Crane Eater or any other church that you're a Christian when you're not? Yeah, somehow it's going to make you feel good. You know what will make you feel good? Accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and believe in Him for your eternal life. That's going to make you feel good. I would be as nervous as a cat on a hot tin roof if every time I hear Howard talking about somebody that ain't truly believing is going to bust hell wide open and it's real fire, it's real pain, it's real suffering for all eternity and I know I'm playing church. I wouldn't be back every Sunday to hear that. They didn't believe it either. So God said, I'm going to show, Mo I'm going to show Egypt I'm going to show the Pharaoh and I'm going to show the children of Israel because they'll get to see all of this. 
and then God makes a way for him to come out, doesn't he? He gets him out, and they cross over, of course, the Red Sea, and God splits the waters, and they get to see the destruction of the army of Egypt, and what a deal that was. And then they started moving in, and right out of the bat, the complaining started. Well, I wish I was back in Egypt. At least every now and then, if they were being truthful with themselves, every now and then we had fish and bread. They didn't have as much as they wanted. And so they complained, and so God's going to, hey, I'm, I'm tired of this already. I mean, he, he was tired like that. I'll just destroy them, Moses, and make you a whole nation. Did he have the ability to do that? Absolutely did. Don't you, you know, Moses is one of the most revered uh, individuals in most religious organizations of the world. You know that? Because all of them kind of ha- hold Moses up because of what, he, what kind of a man he was for God. And you know, if he'd have been like some of us, okay, I can't throw you in that bucket. If he was like me, okay, I would have been, I'm with you, God, wipe them out. I, I'm on your side, Right? I'm, I'm sick and tired of listening to him whine and complain, just like you are, so just, just go ahead. But no, Moses said, no, if you're going to blot them out, blot me too. Wow. Wait a minute. Wow. Every time they, God said, okay, just stand back. You and Aaron stand over here, because I'm getting ready to wipe this bunch out. Y'all stand right over here. They're going to be gone in a second. Y'all stand here. And Moses said, oh, no, wait a minute, Lord. So this is what you want to have happen, God? I mean, Moses was the friend of God. Don't you talk to your friends honestly? Don't you want to tell your friend, you know, if you keep going to these places, you're going to be in a bad place. You need to pick your friends more wisely. Don't you want to tell your friend the truth? And so Moses went to God like a friend and said, is this what you really, you want those Egyptians that were left behind that did survive back in Egypt to hear that you brought them all the way out here in the wilderness to do nothing but destroy them? Because you didn't have the uh, power to get them into the promised land. And so God said, well, you know, you got a good point there. And so he spared them again. Now two of the major religions, three of them, Judaism, Muslims, and Christians all honor Moses because our religions came from there. We came out of the Jewish faith because Jesus Christ was a Jew. And so we read the Old Testament as if he was talking to us. And that's exactly the way God wants it designed. And then we accept his son where the Jews don't. So the commonality ends right there. And then the Muslims also recognize Moses as a great man. And then God says, okay, look, I'm going to give you some direction and guidance because obviously people need rules, right? You don't like them no more than I do probably, but we got to have rules. Do you live in a, in, a, in a lifestyle of rules? Do you? Is there all kinds of rules you have to keep up with? I mean, when you drove in today, there were some rules around that. And I bet nobody in here has broken any of those. <laughs> there was a rule that says you can't drive unless you go get a license. Everybody got a license? Why'd you follow that rule for? Because there's consequences if you don't. Oh, really? What kind of consequences? If you keep up, or you might end up in jail or yeah. fired. Yeah. For not following the rule. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> and there's speed limits. I know you don't know anything about that. But uh, there are speed limits for those that look at them uh, on the road. So, so you quit paying attention to the signs. So now your car's got this little thing in the dash that tells you how fast you're going. You know, so that you can match. The, it, it, there's, it, they, he says, can you match 55 with that 55? That's what we're wanting you to do. So there's rules. And so God said, I'm going to have to give them some rules. He called them Ten Commandments. Right? He says, these are the things I want you to really pay attention to and do. I want you to pay attention to it. You know, we make rules and laws, don't we, that nobody pays any attention to. Right? 
So they did that at Prohibition. You know, they said, we're going to outro- out- outlaw alcohol. And that's going to solve all our problems. Did it? We're going to outlaw hard drugs. That's gonna, we're going to make it against the law to take cocaine. Did, is, are we a cocaine-free society? All of our rules don't necessarily mean people are going to follow them. And they didn't follow God's. He gives very specific commandments. Donna points out that uh, when God sent Moses up to the mount, right? Y'all remember that? And what did, the, what did he tell the Israelites to do? Not approach the mountain, don't touch the mountain, don't get close to the mountain. You or your livestock, you'll die. Now, me and you can't really picture this. I wish, and maybe the guys doing The Chosen will do it someday, they'll do a new version of the Old Testament. Because if you had the computer-generated graphics now that we had like for Star Wars and stuff, we could really make that mountain cooking like it was when Moses went up there. You can't really, you know, we think we had a storm last Thursday. (laughs) Man, when God was on top of this mountain, there were billows of fire and smoke and lightning. You know how like when a volcano erupts, it lightning goes between all the particles of dust and there's all kinds of cloud-to-cloud lightning going. Anybody ever been in an airplane and seen cloud-to-cloud lightning? It'll terrify you because I'm thinking, well, we're flying between clouds, you know. And so my aerospace brain says, don't worry about it. You know, it's not going to electrocute you. Yeah, right. It would just fry all our electronics, and that's just as bad, right? But this is lightning. It's billows of smokes rolling. It's, it's loud. And this was a rocky mountain. I mean, you know, Moses is clawing his way up there. And guess who went with him? Do you all remember who went with him? See, you think, well, Moses went by himself. No, he didn't. The Bible says that Joshua went with him. Joshua went with him. But halfway up the mountain, he said, Joshua, you stay here. i got to go on up. So Joshua was staying there. Just think of poor Joshua. He's on the side of this mountain that's erupting with fire and smoke and lightning and billowing. And he's there. And how long was Moses up there? Joshua was up there 40 days too. On the side of the mountain, wringing his hands, wondering, I wonder what happened to, to Moses. Boy, I sure hope Moses comes back soon. Well, how long would you have lasted? Probably the next day. And okay, Moses is gone. God hadn't spoke to me, so I'm going back down. Forty days of this thunder and lightning, it's never ceasing. You know, we think we can't do without six hours of sleep. Oh, I'm bad if I, I don't get my sleep. Oh, my head's splitting right open. How are you going to sleep on a rocky side of a mountain with thunder and lightning going for 40 days and 40 nights? Talk about being tired. So Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments, gets down to the children of Israel with Joshua. Joshua says, says, Moses, what is that I'm hearing off in the distance down there? There's still a lot of smoke and stuff going on, but it sounds like somebody's having a party. Sounds like somebody's getting killed. I don't know that. He said, no, that ain't what's happening. I can tell you what's happening. So he gets down there, and what have they done? Made a golden calf. Who made it? Who made the golden calf? Aaron, Moses' brother-in-law. Yeah, Moses' brother. He, his own brother goes, now he left him in charge. Okay, I'm going to leave you in charge. Okay, I got this. Forty days later, we got a calf out here, and we're worshiping the thing that it brought us out of Egypt. Now, every stinking one of them knew that was a bold-faced lie. You see why God hates liars? He said there'll be no liars in the kingdom of heaven. He despises the lie. You know, from the very beginning of time, from right back here, when Cain killed Abel, he lied right out of the gate. Eve lied about who gave her the apple. Adam said she did it. He don't like liars. And so they're down there lying, saying that they threw. Aaron said, well, we threw all the golden jewelry from Egypt in there and out pounced this cow. (laughs) Made of pure gold. So it brought us out of Egypt. Lie. It didn't jump out by itself. It didn't bring you out of Egypt. You didn't see a cow anywhere over in the Red Sea. Not no golden cow. It wasn't sitting on the other side waving at you saying, come on. 
come on across. There was no cow, but they worshiped the cow. God says, okay, I'm done with this bunch. We're going to wipe them out. Moses intercedes, says, no, let's not do that. What does he say instead? He says, all of you that I'm going to draw a line of sand, if you're on my side, you better get on this side of the rope. How stupid were there? There was a bunch of them saying, I don't know, that cow, I think, brought me over here. And they didn't cross. And so all the Levites did, of course, and all those. And he said, here's the reward for that. You guys take your sword and go kill your brother who didn't come across. And the Lord sends plagues on them while they're there. But the Lord gives them some rules. And then we have the Levitical laws that start coming into play. God gives him very detailed instructions about the tabernacle, right? And we're going to go over some more of those detailed instructions about the tabernacle. But I think I told you last week that, and, and I had to point it out to Datana again, in, uh, in Exodus chapter 40, if you look at chapter 40, right before that, like 26, 27, up through 30, some of those, he's telling all the details of the craftsmen and all of those that were doing the fine work of sewing and everything that was going on. But chapter 40 is kind of, you know, here's the thing about the Bible. You've got to study it to really understand it because it seems like things are out of place. He tells you about all this getting made and how the tabernacle is going to be set up. And then in 40, he actually sets up the tabernacle. And when you read chapter 40, it says very specifically that Moses set up the tabernacle the first time. Yes, the craftsmen built everything. They did. But they just had it sitting in the corner ready to go. It wasn't in its final place. Not until Moses set up the tabernacle. Because in God's eyes, the only one that was worthy to touch this stuff and make it holy enough for him was Moses. His friend Moses, not anybody else. So he had to put it together, and then the Bible says that he had to take the anointing oil and anoint everything in the tabernacle, every post, every piece of cloth, every piece of, of the furniture, the showbread, the candle opera, everything had to be anointed by Moses in order for it to be holy enough, sanctified enough to be in there when the presence of God came down. And only Moses could do it. What do you all think about that? Does that make sense? What if it didn't make sense to you? Would you still believe it? No, I mean seriously now. If it doesn't make sense to your head, would you still believe it? Who said yes? Why? God don't lie. Huh? Faith. It's the Word of God, isn't it? Do you believe the Word of God or not? See, that's how simple this really is. Because how much do you think a 36-inch wide bench that's like 24 by 36, and it stands about three feet off the ground, and it's got two huge solid gold cherubims, not gold-plated like we do our rings and watches, solid gold. How much do you think that weighs? Jump out there somewhere, it don't matter. I don't have the right answer, so you don't have to worry. 300 pounds. 700 pounds. So how in the world did Moses pick that thing up by himself and put it in the Holy of Holies? See, do you believe that? Do you believe that Moses did it by himself? Yeah, because the Bible says so. Is it a big, hard thing for God to give Moses enough strength to pick that 300, 500, 700, 1,000 pound thing up? Not to me, it ain't. It's a small thing for him to do that. You do believe the Bible, right? You believe that Samson could actually put his two hands between two huge pillars of marble and push them down to where the whole building collapsed? Well, if he can give Samson that kind of strength, you tell him he couldn't give it to Moses? Sure he did. And in the law, here's something that's amazing about God. And we're getting ready to close. If you look in the world, you know, we're a, we're a country that is racially torn. We've been racially torn since we got started. You know, but everybody wants to act like it didn't happen in the beginning, but it did. Because every society before Britain, before Spain, before Italy, they all had slaves, all of them. 
All of the Babylonians had slaves. Probably Abraham had some slaves. We know that there were slaves in their families. We know that there were people bound to them. God allowed the Israelites to have slaves. And now everybody says, well, how can you believe in a people whose God allowed them to have slaves? Everybody had slaves. God doesn't upset everything in the apple cart just to prove you a point. He allowed some of those things to go forth, didn't he? But did you notice in the Levitical law when you read it that God had very specific rules for Israelites and their slaves? You know what one of them was? Now, you would love this. Anybody in here in debt? Oh, yeah. (laughs) No liars. Anybody have debt? Here's the deal. In God's law, every seven years, your debts were wiped off the books. Would you like that? Now, here's how Paul's feeble brain works. I should have got me a lot bigger house. Make that payment any way I can for seven years, buddy, and boom, it's mine. All the slaves were freed after seven years. He told them, you got to treat your slave nicely, kindly. you got to take care of them. you got to free them. And if they don't want to be free, you take their earlobe up to the poles and you drive a nail through it. And they're forever your slave. But you got to give them the opportunity of freedom. you got to give them the choice. And so God looked at slavery different among the Israelites. He said, you got to treat them because one time you were a slave. At one time you were in bondage. At one time you were being treated harshly by a taskmaster. But you're not going to be like that. Even though you have slaves, you're going to treat them nicely. You're going to treat them differently. And did you know that that's the first time in human history that anybody had set up rules and regulations on what you could do with a slave. In every other society, you didn't have to have grounds at all to kill them. If you got up that morning and decided, you know what, I think I'm going to go kill Bob, they'd just go out there and bash his brains in, and that would be it. No repercussions. Where do you think our laws came from? In this country, you go up to the... The, the, uh, to, to the Capitol and you go up to the Supreme Court and Moses is up there in a relief holding the commandments because that's what ours were based on. The fact that there has to be commandments and rules and orders for a society to exist. But he tells us very specifically how we treat our brothers and sisters. How we treat those that are less fortunate than yourself. Don't forget where you came from. Don't forget that people have been nice to you. And that if you have received blessings, how much more you should give blessings to others. And if people you have a lot that you've been forgiven for, how much should you forgive your brother and sister? Seventy times seven? He said, no, you forgive them for it all. Your own brothers and sisters? Yes. My, my Christian brothers and sisters? Yes. Yes. When they wrong us, when they stick us with a big old telephone bill, Pastor, what do you got to do? You got to forgive them. To whom much is being given, much is required. And that includes forgiveness. Don't become hard-hearted. Don't become stingy with the grace of God. Don't become stingy with the mercies of God. Be freely given it to others. As that one atheist said, how in the world? He said, you guys... You know, you make me sick to my stomach, you Christians do. You know good and well that I'm going to bust hell wide open. For all eternity, I'm going to be in torment. And you're afraid to tell me about it because of the rules, not written rules, the accepted rules of a society. You're going to let me burn in hell and not tell me about Jesus Christ. What kind of Christians are you? That's what an atheist said. That's how sincere it is. To us. We need to evaluate that. God gave Moses laws. Did the people follow him to the T? Did he eradicate them off the earth? No. Because he is full of grace and God is full of mercy. Ever ready to forgive us of our sins. All he asks us to do is confess them with our mouth and ask him to touch our hearts. Amen. Hope you all got some of the lesson today. God bless.